Hi, I'm Dr. Richard Visser, and in this podcast, I will take you on a journey through the wilderness of scientific research and experiential knowledge. Together, we will clear a path to optimizing health, well-being, and longevity. I am a former Minister of Health and Sports with a PhD in Medical Sciences, a published researcher in the fields of obesity, lifestyle medicine, and longevity. I started my career path over three decades ago as a doctor of chiropractic. I'm excited to share my methods, know-how, and experience with you. So please join me on the Visser Podcast. Welcome to the Visser Podcast. This is episode number 12. This is the last of our foundation series. From here on in, it's free range. I want to know what you guys want to talk about. I want to know what you guys, what topics you guys like. So I want feedback. And from there, we'll build some stuff. I've already built a couple of the framework of a couple new episodes, but I'd like to have input from you, what you feel is important, what we need to be talking about as far as lifestyle, health, wellness, and longevity goes. So today I really want to focus in on a big part of what we see in the blue zones. What are the blue zones? First of all, let's start there. For the people that don't know it, blue zones are areas in the world where people tend to live, you know, old, over a hundred, um, healthy. And there are areas such as Sardinia, Italy, yeah, Greece, Okinawa, Japan, Nicoya Peninsula, Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, California, to name a few. And in these areas, we've noticed that people are healthier, and it's not due to better healthcare or better hospitals or better doctors or better specialists. They live longer. Their quality of life is higher. And so... A lot of researchers have been studying these blue zones saying, okay, what, what is that? What, you know, what are the keys? And so one of the keys here is social, the social side of things, which in big cities and in the West we've lost and we're losing. So we've already talked about the nutrition. We talked about exercise. These are things that we see in these areas. They don't do exercise as we do artificially where we have to go to a gym where we have to actually lift and you know do the resistance exercise to be able to you know create longevity in our lives they actually do it as part of life they walk uphill they carry stones they carry grows i mean everything is carried walked it's it's they're very active uh, they retain their muscle mass you know, as far as nutrition goes, they stick to whole foods and they stick to, you know, lean protein. Yes, they'll, they'll have wine. You will see olive oil, healthy fats. So, you know, especially not processed foods or super processed foods. So, so these are commonalities, but the biggest one, and, and, you know, they differ, they differ from area to area. The biggest commonality is their social side. So we're going to talk about their social side because this is where we can learn, you know, some stuff. This is where we can learn of where we're going wrong in this new age in the West and, you know, Europe, the United States, these, these countries. Well, you know, to, to some extent, third world, I mean, everywhere. I mean, you know, we, we, I tend to say the West, because we're more separated as families in Latin culture. So if you go to Latin America and the Caribbean, you still see some is living together, multiple generations taking care of each other. So that is to a certain extent still alive there. We see that in the Middle East, some. We see it in Turkey, where I'm now a lot. We see it in india we see it in you know these countries but as far as the u.s goes and europe goes we have you know beautiful homes 
you know, retirement homes, elderly homes, multiple stages. So we tend to ship, you know, the elderly off. And there are, yeah, there's benefits to us, convenience maybe. We live, you know, we all live in distance from each other. In these countries, in these areas, they live together very close. So it's easier to, to make that happen. But a lot, a lot gets lost. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that means in a social sense. Um, when we look at, when we look at social connections, they can have a significant impact on our overall health and longevity. We see lower rates of depression, you know, and, and stress. We see decrease in chronic diseases and people tend to live longer. In the blue zones, people often have a sense of purpose and belonging. And this is the, the other part. When we ship the elderly off, they kind of disconnect, lose their sense of purpose, lose their sense of belonging, going to a new area. And this, this, this has a big impact. You know, I'll give you a personal story. A friend of mine, a good friend of mine, who worked his whole life for this big corporation, global corporation, at the top, an executive just went on retirement and he's lived, he's one of my good friends. He's lived all over the world and has stories from every country. I mean, I haven't, you know, I know anyone that has lived in more places than he has. And it's because of his work, but his work was everything. So his work was his social, his work was his activities, his work, you know, golfing, you know, exercise, everything was his work had to do with his work, his social, and it, he had a chuck full social calendar, but it all had to do directly or indirectly with work. And so at the end of his career, he gets to, you know, and he didn't build a family. He has family, but he himself. And so at the end of his career, you know, say close to 70 and he finally goes retirement and it's a shock. He all of a sudden disconnects to everything and everyone because everything was tied to his work. So once that happened, he realized all these people, all these connections gone, social activities gone, sense of purpose, belonging gone. Now he has to reinvent that. And it's very difficult because he hadn't built anything up. No specific hobbies were built up. Yeah, he was golfing, but he was golfing with his work buddies, his work colleagues, his, his you know, the clients, governments, whatever. And so he, he went to golf a couple of times. It wasn't the same. It wasn't the same because the interaction wasn't there. The reason wasn't there. Purpose wasn't there. It was just empty golf. So how many times are you going to golf? So he went a couple of times. So I, he doesn't want to turn to alcohol. He doesn't want to turn to anything like that because that's the next move. It's like, okay, let me start drinking. Or let me go fish. But he doesn't have a history of fishing. So now he has to reinvent himself. And it's become a very difficult, especially at that age, difficult to reconnect where he is now or to connect where he is now people you know build relationships over time it's not like hey i need an instant relationship or i need instant groups to belong to and you're gonna have to build it so this is what happens with with also our parents that get older if we ship them off you know that that sense of purpose that sense of belonging that sense of having meaning to the family to the people you love is gone is gone and you become and you can actually start feeling like a parasite and that is devastating there's even a book written about it that you know how people that lose limbs or you know lose function and are dependent get this feeling this overwhelming feeling and it's it's horrible and so, yes, this is part of what keeps these communities young and growing. So we're going to, we're going to dive in a little bit. The sense of purpose is big 
in these communities, they have a sense of purpose, belonging, which is also provided by the community, the family. And at the same time, we see a strong sense of spirituality and, and religions. So this type of social engagement and connection can boost mental and emotional well-being. It's kind of indirectly what we've been talking about. So you have here a sense of, you know, emotional, mental well-being. You have a sense of belonging, you have community. It's an intricate part of how we age well, how we age, how we look forward to things. And I'm going to talk a little bit further along, when we're further along about, about this. So remember this, how we look forward to things will come back up. It'll come back up in maybe an area that you don't expect, but it'll come back up. So the Blue Zones longevity relies on a strong, co cohesive families, a culture that encourages engagement in community activities and events, and a sense of social responsibility and engagement in community service. So it's giving back. It's really feeling like, you know, someone's counting on me or animals are counting on me, or, you know, it could be a garden, simpler, but it has to be that connection, that community that, you know, that makes our life full. So we don't live in blues. I mean, I don't, you know, and I'm not going to move there. Um, and, and vice versa, if we take someone that lives in a blue zone and we bring them to a big city and they start living there, guess what? They'll die early. So it's not. You know, it's really the environment that dictates. See, genetics is 20%. Environment, 80%. So the environment really influences. Environment plays a huge key. It's one of the things that I've studied with childhood obesity and obesity and obesogenic environments. Huge, huge studies on this. So we know the environment is a key factor. So in our time, what are we seeing? Where, where are we going? Well, how do we communicate? Let's start there as compared to the blue zones in our time, social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, this is how we, this is our new social standard, online forums, you know, Reddit, Quora. I mean, this is, this is where we're these these virtual we're, we're in this virtual world we, we live we don't have time we you know there's a lot of traffic we live in cities our time is completely limited we're doing you know we're doing a lot of stuff for our work our family visits and children vis are limited a couple times a year maybe you know maybe we're doing it in special occasions but it's not continuous they don't live downstairs Okay, so we have virtual support groups. We do video conferencing instead of, you know, being with people. We do virtual events now. Gamification. Oh my. Gamification. I could go on. I mean, it's the new babysitter for babies, for young children. I mean, there isn't a restaurant I go to where I see parents with their kids and the kids are on their phone doing games. And guess what? This is how, this is a new babysitter. What impact does that have on these children? Massive. I'm not going to go into that because you're going to get me going and I'm going to go off tangent. I got to stick to this right here. As compared to the blue zones, you know, 
strong social networks with provide, which provide emotional and practical support. Sense of purpose, ikigai, okay, provides motivation and meaning in their lives. Active participation in the community, real community, not virtual, real, active. So you're physically doing something. Participation in religious and spiritual practices, social activities, volunteer work, real, daily, family, and intergenerational connections. Daily, not on holidays. Daily. Shared values and tradition. Provides a sense of community, a sense of belonging. Digital era, completely off completely different we're, we're so how do we create this you know we have to create a hybrid system so because we're not able to go you know we are all not able to you know move to these blue zones and live there and, li and live in these these you, you have to kind of be there for a long time integrate you know it's it's not realistic so how what can we learn from this what, what are the key factors and we've spoken about you know the foundation work We've spoken about this, okay? Mitigating stress, looking at depression, and what we can do for it. You know, the, the, big, the big pillars, exercise, what type of exercise we need to be doing. Eating, intermittent fasting, our, our you know, gut biome, protecting that, diversifying that. How do we do all that? That's all in the foundational work. So we're building up to this. This is the social part. So we have to analyze something okay we have to analyze what gives us a good life this question what gives us a good life now a lot of you say and a lot of people say i just want to be happy happiness is the key i just want to be happy and then i'm good guess what when we look at it in research terms happiness is just one part there's three parts three parts to a full fulfilled life to where you feel and you're motivated, and you can move, and you actually live longer with a higher quality of life. So we look at, you know, I'll, I'll look at a neuroscientist, Dr. Atoli Shara, you know, the optimism bias. We're hardwired for optimism. There's some good work and some good books that she's, she's produced. So when we look at the three parts that make up, like what gives us a good life, one of them is happiness. The other one, meaning. Meaning. And this is what we talked about before in this blue zones. One of the main purposes in the blue zones is people feel like they belong. They have meaning. They're getting up in the morning for something because they're contributing. They're com contributing to their community. They're com contributing to other people. And this is key. So meaning the reason to be, you're making a difference with people. This is key. So this is the second one. We're going to come back to the third one, but I want to go back to happiness. You know, there's a great study from Harvard done years ago with a lot of participants. I mean, it's a very broad study. And it was based on, you know, happiness and people going, and they, and they looked at one part of happiness. And this was, you know, we all can connect to this, planning a vacation. Okay, we're going to plan a vacation with the family, so everyone's excited. And so they checked people that were planning to go on vacation to whatever place, and they checked their happiness grade kind of before they went on vacation, during the vacation, and after the vacation. And so guess where? the people were the happiest right before the vacation. Not in the vacation, not after the vacation, right before the vacation. Our expectation, the way our brain works. So this gives us our insight on how our brain works, how we, you know, assimilate information. What gives us that rush, that dopamine, that happy feeling rush? And it's really in the planning. It's really in anticipating for something that's going to happen in the future. 
So really, we always need to be having this carrot out there in the future. This contributes to our happiness. We have to plan. If we have nothing, we have no plans, like 2023 started and I'm like, what are you going to do this year? Nothing. You're going to go anywhere this year? Nothing. You have anything planned with anyone? Nothing. Guess what? My happiness grade is going to go down. I need to be planning stuff. I need to be looking forward to something. It could be simple stuff. You know, coffee in the morning. You know, new place open. It's simple. It doesn't need to be a huge thing. But this is key. So this is one side of happiness. Um, we, they also looked at people that were ready to make a big change in their life or they were being pushed to make a change in their life. And if they were happiest before they made the change or after they made the change, knowing that the change could, you know, not pan out. First of all, people that actually made the step to make the change were happier and they, they, you know, they felt, they felt that it felt rewarding. And with that, they gained confidence to actually make other move. So it's getting our, out of our comfort zone. This leads into the psychological rich life, which is number three. We have, we need a psychological rich life, which means we need to incorporate in our lives variety. We need to explore. And now this is in our DNA. Humans have been explorers from the beginning of time. This is how we, you know, found the new world. This is how we went around. This is how we did everything. And in that, there's a, there's a, you know, there's risk, right? There's a chance it won't go well, but we need it. It's part of our DNA. So we need to feed this part. This is the third part of what gives us a good life. So it's the psychological rich life we need to explore we need to incorporate a little uncertainty and risk but as we look at this as we look at this uncertainty and risk if we take this uncertainty with our job with, with whatever a chance we're taking a chance we're we're experiencing something new if it goes good like i said we get even more positive. This is the optimism bias. We're optimism bias. So our optimism just starts cranking up. Oh man, this went well. So I'm going to do more stuff and it goes well. And I'm going to do more stuff. And so these people just, you know, because they're moving and they have positive feedback coming back, this optimism just steamrolls. Now the opposite can happen when it doesn't work your way. So you got to be careful with that. And there's ways to kind of manage that. So when, you know, when it doesn't go well, we kind of go to pessimistic side. And that, that's dangerous because we start seeing in every proposal or in every challenge that comes up or, um, you know, every opportunity that presents to us, we'll start looking at the negative stronger than the positive and skew our ability to assess it evenly, correctly, so we can move on it. So this, this is a problem. And it's also a problem because a lot of times this also happens. So the, the, you know, because we're, like I said before, we're wired for optimism, but the pessimism will come in. The pessimism comes also comes in in our lives when we have stress in other parts of our life. Stress with relationship, financial stress, stress with a child doing badly or, you know, at school. Some stress, war in the world, whatever, our job. If, we, if we've got stress, if we've got this stress and we're not mitigating it, we're not dealing with it, which is, you know, we talk about that in, in the foundation work and episodes couple of episodes before this, then we'll tend to move towards pessimism, which doesn't help us. 
It will not help us with our relationships, with our career, with moving forward in life. So we have to watch that. So we have to mitigate the stress and then go back to the stress episode where we do, you know, where you can do different things, cold immersion. I mean, there's tons of stuff that we've talked about on stress, analyzing stress. Is it short-term stress, middle-term stress, or long-term stress? And how do we, how do we approach it? So we really have to watch our brain. Watch how we think. Notice what's happening. One of the things that 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 I you know that I've taught a lot and and that I still use is control the issue of control. So, if you have you know teams working for you, large teams and and which I have had, the control issue is one that's tricky. So I can come in, I can come in and say, okay, I want this done. This is what I'm done. This is my purpose. This is, you know, what I want to get done at this time. Or I can meet with my team or meet with the individuals and say, listen, I have these options. Okay. Four or five options. I want you to choose which fits better with you, where you feel more connected to and move them in that sense, still to the option I would like. But when they choose it, they have this perceived control and with perceived control comes commitment, more commitment. There also comes this feeling of optimism that takes them over because as soon as they take that as their own, they're committed to it. They're optimistic about it. They're going to make it work because it's them. It's their choice. So this is the part of control, perceived control. When you get, when you pressure someone to do something or force it. This is with children, employees, colleagues, you name it. There's never that commitment. There's never that feeling of optimism. There's never a feeling of ownership. And so the control plays a huge role. If we are, and so, so, so you, do you see where I'm going with this? Now I'm giving you tidbits on things we need to watch for in our pursuit to happiness, in our pursuit to meaning in life and challenges. So one of the things that happens, I'm guilty of this as I think we all is that this is also how our brain works. If we are around the same things every day, all the time, our brain shut it down. It shuts it off. We get bored. Okay. So an easy way to saying, if there's an annoying no noise in the room, that's continuous. If you sit there long enough, you will not hear it brain will filter it out because your brain gets bored. This is the same with your kids, family, your home, uh, everything around you, stuff you've bought. If it's there long enough, consistently, your brain shuts it out. This is a danger. This is how we lose relationships. This is how we, you know, start getting bored and looking for other stuff, new stuff. So no, you have to know that your brain does this. Okay. And this is the same reason when we go on vacation or when we have a business trip or whatever, we're away for five days, we come back, we see our family again, or we see the, our friends again, or our, our relationship partner. We're like, Oh my God, you know, this is renewed love feeling excitement, feeling, etc. What do you think? Our brain had a little rest. We need these rests. We need these rests. Another thing is looking at the situation in a different light. So I'm used to my partner being in the house, being around me all the time. And then one night I go and she has to speak in front of a big crowd and she killed it or not. 
but I see her speak. I see all these people look at her, paying attention to her. And it just ignites me. It's like, oh my God, wow, look at her. You feel proud, you feel happy, you feel like, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm with her. Perfect, my choices. Completely different. It's out of context. All of a sudden your brain is having a new light. It's a new thing for your brain. It's a new toy, you know, I almost want to say. So this is how we need to, we need to manage our expectations. We need to play with the brain in this sense. We need to know that our brain gets bored of consistency. So we need newness and we need to, and newness doesn't mean a new relationship or new kids or anything like that. No, newness means, you know, put a different light on it, change it, give it a little bit of space, come back so that it stays fresh, so that it stays there, so that you're excited, so that your brain can really be excited about it. Don't force yourself because that's not going to work. But with a couple of these tricks, you're able to keep it fresh, both sides, everyone. And it's important. Happiness is a U-shaped curve. Now, you know, when I first saw this, I was like, oh my God, man. this is, so as kids, and this is in general, because people have depression and, and stress at different times in their life. But in general, okay, we're looking at happiness in your first part of life, midlife crisis, literally, boom, you're in the low part. Okay, so you're anywhere from in your 40s to 50s or even before you can broaden it out a little bit you're in the low end you're in the low end of the pits and then after 60 you come back out and you're happy again or happier again so it's a you and this has been studied over and over again large population sizes so be aware of that it's real okay so there's a lot you can do there, but you need to know what's coming. If we're informed and we know this stuff is coming, there's a lot we can do. If we're just taking it as it comes, trust me, it's going to work. You're going to crack. You know, it, I've seen it so many times. If you're ready for an event, if you're ready for whatever's coming and you're well informed and you've done everything, you've done the work, you're you have that perceived control. At least you have more information. Your experience is completely different than someone that's just sitting there and waiting to be hit by it. So it's, it's critical that we do that. You know, another, there's two more things that, I'm, that are truly interesting that I go through that the research has shown that children don't make us happy. Actually, if you look at Daniel Carman's research, it's less happier. Now, in general. So this whole idea, and I know we have this, a lot of us have this, hey, our relationship isn't that good. Let's have children because that's going to make me happy. You know, it's like a new puppy. Let's, children are going to make me happy. Children are going to give me, no, don't do it for that reason because it's not going to do it. It's only going to make it worse. Okay. Being in a marriage doesn't necessarily make us happier. The happier comes from being in a relationship. Marriage doesn't show to give us that extra happiness. Just a note. Just a note. And really, we're also looking at divorce. And research shown has shown that we're able to bounce back pretty quickly. I mean, yes, we're dramatic. It's heavy. It's hard. I know it firsthand. But we bounce back. Research shows over and over again, we adapt really quickly as humans. Neuroplasticity, baby. And really, we need to always be focusing on extending our neuroplasticity. So it's things we do after our workout. It's things we do during the day. It's, you know, it's being creative, you know, helping our neuroplasticity. It's being, you know, going... Uh, for a psychological rich life, it's going to help our neuroplasticity. All this stuff is going to help our brain. It's going to help our mental capacity. It's going to help, you know, our psychological capacity. So this is, this is my social part. 
Thank you very much for watching. If you really like the content and we've got amazing content coming, trust me, this is, you know, I had to do the foundation work because I feel that we all need the foundation. The work on the fringes, like way out there work is great. It's exciting. But if you don't have the foundation, it's useless. So you need the foundation. Go back to the foundation, get your foundation right. Then we can build. Thank you very much. Subscribe, ring the bell notification. Join me in this wild ride of health, wellness, longevity. Take care. See you soon.